So humans are the ones that cause all the environmental problems on the planet. So in order for us to appreciate the damage that we have caused, we really need to understand more about human population ecology and dynamics. So chapter seven is just about humans and how our population has changed and what affected those changes, what has caused them to occur. So this is Mrs. Gabriel. I'm gonna go over chapter seven and we're gonna start with the first module. Now in class, I had you predict a couple things. You can pause the video if you were not in class because of band or some other field trip. And then I showed you, I went to this Worldometers website and I showed you the answers to all of these and you were all shocked with the answers to the questions because you were all wrong with your predictions. That's great. That means we have a purpose for learning. So this is obviously going to introduce us to China. China is the world's most populous country right now. They have 1.4 billion people. Remember that the world population is almost 7.8 billion. So they represent almost 20% of the world's population. And they're the largest emitter of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. You'll learn the importance of that soon. You have to get used to some words, and one of the big words is affluence. Affluence has to do with how rich a country is. So if a country is richer and our affluence increases, then we are more likely to cause environmental damage or environmental degradation. So if the affluence of a country increases, environmental degradation increases. Also, FYI, China consumes one third of all the fish and seafood worldwide. You'll learn why that's important in a future chapter. And if they continue to consume and pollute with the number of people that they have, and it's because of the number, they will, they're on target to surpass us in, um, in what they emit into the air. And you've probably heard about the one child policy that went into effect in the 70s, where they were rewarded with money if they had one child or less and they had to pay penalties or they suffered some other consequence, negative consequence, if they had more than one child. This ended up dropping their fertility rate to 1.5%, and you'll see what, what happens as a result of that. So you can go to either of these on your own so that you can learn about what you saw in class. This was the one that sounded like a heartbeat. You really liked it. You enjoyed it. And the heartbeat just showed you how population changed over time with the little dots that represented a million people. Okay, so these are the objectives. We're really going to focus on all three of them. We're going to end with age structure diagrams. And in class, you are also drawing or instructing an age structure diagram so you really understand the mathematics behind how demographers look at and evaluate and compare populations. Okay, so China's the second largest consumer of petroleum, that's gasoline and oil. We're number one, <laughs> yay. And they are also responsible for a ton of industrial activity. They are becoming more and more industrialized as a country. Uh, you can see all the cars that they have here. We have a lot of cars too, but they actually have more efficient fuel standards than we do. So the pollution that they are emitting, even though they have more cars than us, the amount of kilograms of pollutants that they put in the air is going to be more than us for a long time. Even though they have more cars than us, one car to one car, their cars do not put as much pollutants in the air per mile that they drive. That's what that means. All right, so the carrying capacity of Earth is what we're going to look at in the next few charts. So you need to take these things away from this. Under the ideal conditions, that is with no limiting factors, all populations of all organisms, including humans, are going to grow exponentially. And we've talked about that exponential growth. J curves, J curves, J curves. In most cases, this exponential growth is going to stop or slow. That's when we go into that S part of the curve, when our limits are reached, which can be food. 
So you learned about human population growth um, and ecology and how populations grow with a lab that we did with the beans. So if you look at human population, it did not grow exponentially until it started that J-curve right around here, which was around the year 1600, which was around 400 years ago. So that is when we started experiencing exponential growth, but we were not growing exponentially here. And you should understand that a little more from the bean lab. It takes a while for this to occur. So a couple other stats, every five days worldwide, we get about 2 million births and 800,000 deaths. More births than deaths. And it was not always this way. It wasn't even this type of ratio. We'll talk about that soon. So why was the human population stable until around this time? And this is the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about. But agriculture, we started getting better agricultural technology. We didn't have to use a horse to pull the plow. We were actually getting mechanical machinery, mechanical plows, where plowing our land and harvesting our foods. We also got more sanitary water and food conditions, so our water was safer to drink. These two things, giving us more food and um, giving us cleaner water, helps more people survive, which is why the number of births increased, so we had more births than we had deaths, which is why another reason why this J-curve occurred. We also had better living conditions overall. And as I said before, we are approaching 7.8 billion people on the planet. All right, so this is what you need to take away right here. Population growth occurs when a species birth rate exceeds its death rate. That is when growth will occur. And the United States current birth rate is 12.5 births per second to 8.7 deaths Per, th per thousand, thousand, thousand. We have more births than deaths. So scientists don't agree on carrying capacity. Earth does have a carrying capacity. It's only going to be able to hold so many humans. Tom Malthus was the guy that assumed that humans are going to exceed the carrying capacity because humans grow exponentially and the food supply grows linearly and we're going to run out of food. Some people think that we have the technology, agricultural technology and innovation, where we are going to be able to survive with even more people. The earth will be able to carry us because we are going to come up with some new fancy farming machinery. What do you think? All right, so the people that study hey, here's our guy, Hans Rosling. He's and Swedish. You got to watch his called demographers. Laughed, was able to study that stuff. Um, they won't accept it's very cool. And, and, he was a demographer that see, taught us a lot so about many it, of the concepts that are in this chat. So we played a population doubling time activity with the bean pot, the parent pot, and the offspring pot, where you guys should have taken away the following information. The population started to grow exponentially when there were no population controls in place, and the population doubled in less generations than the one where there were population controls in place, such as making a choice. All right, so there are top five, there's a top five list of factors that actually drive population growth. What are they if one of them is the change in population size? So what this means is if you have a bigger population, the population growth will increase more quickly. What are the other four factors that drive population growth? You can pause and guess and then play again. So birth and death rates fertility, life expectancy, and migration. We'll talk about each of them, starting with changes in population size. So a couple of the big words that you need to know with this are immigration. That's the movement of people that immigrates into a country or a region. Emigration is the number of people that, or movement of people out of a country, that's who leave. 
The CBR is the number of births per thousand, and the CDR, crude death rate, is the number of deaths per thousand. So let's practice a little with this. So imagine that you have 150 million people in a country, and you have 850,341 births out of those 150 million to 525,000 deaths. What do you think, I want you to pause this, is the CBR and the CDR? And keep in mind that we report these per thousand. CBR and CDR. So you're going to pause, try and calculate, guess that, and then I'm going to show the answers as soon as you unpause. So we have 5.6 births per thousand. And I calculated that by, I took three zeros off of each of these, or three places off of these, because it was per thousand. So one, two, three, per thousand. One, two, three. One, two, three. And when I divided these, I got 5.6. So our CBR for this country is 5.6 births per thousand. And our deaths, I did the same thing, which gave me 3.5 deaths per thousand. Okay, so net migration rate is just the difference between everything that's coming into a country and everything that goes out of a country. So it makes sense that births and immigration are the people that appear, that come into, that move into the country, and emigration and deaths are all the total of people that leave. These are the outputs of a population. And that is what we refer to as the net migration rate, the difference between these two groups. And again, we report it per thousand. And the reason we re report it per thousand is so that we can compare country to country. Okay, so a little more about these values again. We use this to do a lot of calculations. CBR is number of births per thousand. CDR is number of deaths per thousand. Then global population growth rate is this minus this divided by 10. That's how we come up with a growth rate. We're going to practice that soon. That's global. But if we're looking at just country to country, we can count immigration and emigration. So this is our input minus our output divided by 10. So these are both growth rates. We cannot have people immigrate and emigrate onto the earth. We have a few people that go out in space that doesn't, that doesn't count. So this is when we're talking about country to country. Global, we do not count immigration and emigration. Another one you're going to have to know is doubling time. So doubling time, we use the rule of 70. There's a lot of calculus behind this. Uh, I'll show you another day because I know that you haven't taken calculus yet. But 70 divided by the doubling time is the growth rate, which is this stuff right here. Or we can say 70 divided by this stuff right here is going to tell us how long it's going to take in years for a population to double. That's human population. So let's practice these real quick. You're going to pause after I explain this, and then you're going to check your answers. So calculate for rate and doubling time if we look at the slide, the last slide's scenarios. We have 5.6 births per thousand, so that's our CBR, and we have 3.5 deaths per thousand, that's our CDR. I want you to try and calculate what the rate is, the growth rate of this population at these current births and deaths, and calculate the doubling time. Pause and calculate. So for growth rate, we had to find the difference between births and deaths and divide by 10 to give us a rate of 0.21. For our doubling time, we had to take the rule of 70 so 70 divided by that rate, which was 0.21, which gave us a time of 333 years. That means that a population with this many births and deaths is going to double in 333 years. So if this population had 10,000 people with this many births and deaths at a given point in time, they had 10,000 people, they will double to 20,000 people in 333 years. That's how that works. Okay, another factor is fertility. So you have to know some other words with this. One is total fertility rate. 
which is average number of children that a woman will have during her childbearing years. Of course, we're not going to have a woman who's 80 years old having a baby. Replacement level fertility, RLF, is the rate, the total fertility rate, that we need to offset the number of deaths in a population. So ours is 1.9. Actually, it's lower than that now. In your book, it's 1.9. I think we're down to like 1.76 in October of 2017. So this is our fertility rate. This is the number of births per woman in our country on average. Our replacement level um, it's, is higher than that. So that means that we are not currently giving birth to enough children to replace our current population. And this replacement level would be higher if there were a lot of babies dying in a country. All right, so we're going to look at this chart for a minute and we're gonna do some very, very easy, just look at and do some simple math in your head. So in 1900, that's right here on the chart, we had a population of about 1.2 billion people. This is real, 1900, 1.2 billion people. So my question is, how many years did it take to double? Can you determine that by looking at this chart? You can. If it's 1.2, all you have to do is say 1.2 doubled is 2.4. So from 2.4, so from 1900 to 1940, it took about 40 years, 1900 to 1940, to double, 40 years to double. All right, how many years did it take for the Earth's total population to double to 4 billion? So 4 billion is here. and half of four billion is two billion, and that's about 1930 to 1970. So this population doubled from here to here in just 40 years. That 40 has nothing to do with the other 40. Now let's try six billion. So for six billion, you have to think about what's half of six billion, three billion. So we had six billion here, half of that is at three billion, whoops, three billion was here, and that was from 1960 to 2000, which was about 40 years to double. So this population right here doubled in size within 40 years. So you don't even have to calculate anything in this case, you can just look at the graph. And then 3.5 to 7 billion is, whoops, sorry, didn't have that example, is also 40 years, doing the same stuff we did. So the projected world population not many scientists agree on this. By 2050, it could be anywhere in here. And Hans Rosling actually thinks that we'll be at around 11 billion people. Of course, this is not considering if famine occurs or a horrible plague wipes out the population, then that could change. So life expectancy is the average number of years that an infant is expected to live. Infant mortality is the number of deaths. Mortality means deaths, deaths, mortality. Infant mortality is the number of deaths per thousand again. That's how we compare countries for children under one. It's easiest if we compare everything per thousand. Child mortality is for number of deaths on, for kids under five per thousand, per thousand. Some other words that you need to know, and we're gonna apply it to a map in a minute, are developed countries and developing. So we are a developed country. Um, on AP exams, this is not in your book, but you should know this. They've actually referred to us as an MDC, a more developed country. So just be familiar with it in case it pops up. So a more developed country is just more developed than a less developed country. By being more developed, we have more industrialization factories and we have higher incomes. And our replacement level fertility will be under two. So our population will not be replaced by the number of births that are currently happening. That's, that's how you fit into the mold of the developed country. If you're a developing country, developing country, then you have low levels of industrialization, 
and people make less than $3 per day, so their GDP is incredibly low. And because so many infants die, their replacement level fertility is actually over 2.1 births per woman. Okay. So less developed and least developed and blue is advanced economies. So if you look at the blues in transition and dark blue, let's start with the dark blue. That is our more developed country. That's us guys and a lot of Europe and Australia and Japan. Our less developed countries, let's go with orange, are much of Africa and our least developed is the other part of Africa and much of South America and Asia. These are our least developed countries. If you can remember this map and you start learning and paying attention to in your like in your other classes, what countries where you're going to go far in this course, you really do need to understand these things to help you be able to explain stuff on the test. Okay, factor four is life expectancy. So just in case you didn't know this, the US average is about 78 years of age. That's because of our medical care. It's really quite amazing. So it allows us you know, to be saved. If we have infections, we get access to medicine and healthcare and we have proper nutrition, we all have access to food and we all have access to safe water. So we're expected to live a lot longer. Now anyone that's dark green, Notice where the dark greens are. These are the countries where people will live longer or expected to live longer. And notice where you're lucky if you're gonna make it to your 50s. Notice where those countries are located. See any connections yet? So you have a higher life expectancy if you have a higher standard of living, which basically means all the things that I've explained and a higher GDP. Higher life expectancy is also associated with wasting more. So we consume more resources, we use more of our land, we mine for more materials that we throw away, and a higher life expectancy is therefore associated with more environmental impacts. That is why we're learning about humans. Okay, um, Males also, just so you know, tend to have a lower life expectancy because they are just higher risk people, they take more risks and that's a cultural thing. Um, also, they are more likely to be the ones that go into battle at war and die. They make more hazardous choices. Again, this is a cultural thing. And there are some biological factors. They're at higher risk of, have, of dying of heart disease and some other diseases. Okay, so now let's compare our maps. This is, this is fun and interesting. So I want you to look at the blue on our top map. We've already looked at these, so now we're gonna compare them. So these are our more developed countries, which is also associated with a higher life expectancy. Don't forget Europe in there, same colors for our MDCs. And our life expectancy and the type of country that we are is also associated with the infant mortality rate. So if you look at this final map right over here, and I'll zoom in on this a little more in the next slide, this shows us the U.S. rate for number of infants that die per thousand. 6.6 .6 infants die per thousand. Now look what countries are similar to ours. 6.6. .6. That's actually really low, guys, because look at the worldwide rate. 49 babies die per thousand. So 49 for every thousand babies born worldwide die. But in our country, only 6.6 .6 of those babies die. And notice that that is highly correlated with life expectancy, and that is highly correlated with the most developed countries. Okay, so a little more about infant mortality. Um, my mouse isn't working right, sorry. Okay, so actually before we do that, a country's life expectancy is high, life expectancy is high, and infant mortality is low if it has a high level of healthcare, right? So think about this for a minute. If we live long and our babies don't die, that's what that means. It's probably because we have a lot of healthcare. Plus this, 
and try and guess what are some other reasons why a country might have a high life expectancy and a low infant mortality. Then unpause to see the answers. Getting adequate food and access to food. Getting potable drinking water. That means sanitary drinking water. Drinking water without parasites and bacteria and viruses and things that make us sick. Good sanitation. Oh, and also potable is just getting drinking water. Moderate pollution, less exposure to hazards. All right, so what if its life expectancy is low? You don't live long and the infant mortality rate is high. What does that tell us about that country? Now that you've looked at all the maps and you've learned things, well, you should have said the opposite of all these things here. So the infant mortality in the U.S., as I said, um, is pretty low compared to the world. It's around 6, 6.6 .6 on this map. But some things that you need to pay attention to, it's much higher for African Americans, Native Americans, and Mexican Americans, Hispanics. It's higher for all of them. And this is related to lower income and less access to adequate nutrition and health care. All right, so infant mortality, remember, is number of deaths for children under one per thousand births. Child is children under five. So Mexico has a crude death rate of five per thousand. U.S. is now closer to eight per thousand. Why do you think that is? Why does Mexico have a CDR, crude death rate, of five and we're closer to eight? Well, it's because infant mortality rates are lower in developed countries and higher in developed countries. Okay. So now I want you to look at, these are like the North American continent, and these are the number of people in millions that are infected with HIV. Now compare us to, oh my God, look at this bar right here, Sub-Saharan Africa, and how many people per Oh, millions, sorry, you are infected with HIV. And then compare us to these other countries. You should start noticing some trends. So diseases really do regulate human population and population growth. So some diseases are infectious diseases like HIV. And infectious diseases are the second biggest killer worldwide after heart disease. Um, some other big ones are tuberculosis and malaria. So out of this HIV infection zone here, 34 million people living with HIV worldwide. 33, 34 million. And 22 million in just sub-Saharan Africa. And it affects population growth and population changes. By the way, 23% of Southern Africans contract it, um, which brings their life expectancy down. So instead of living to, you know, 63 years old, they live to only 40. And rape is the leading cause of transmission of HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, our last top five factor of population growth and change is migration. So we talked about this already. Migration is not birth and death. It's the movement of people in and out of a country or a region. So that can affect whether a population grows or whether it's stable. Take a look at where we have the most migration. Okay, so we're gonna start with what we're most familiar with and that's us in Canada, okay? So our in-migration is above 10 per million people. Above 10 migrants per million people come into our countries. Look where else they migrate in. And the purple countries are where we have around 10 people leaving per million people in that population. This is where people are leaving. Okay, we're going to talk about age structure diagrams. 
So those are pyramids. Think of population pyramids. And the big takeaways are that it's going to be widest at the bottom, smallest at the top in a developing country. In a developing country. And population momentum is what we're going to be experiencing for a while in our world. And that's where the population grows after we've put reduction measures into place. Population momentum continues for several generations until everybody is following the reduction plans. So this is a typical age structure diagram. We have our pre-reproductive age, that's our young ones. Our reproductive age, that's who can have babies. And this, these are our older people. And we have the male side and the female side. We're going to make, we did make these in class. So a couple things that you can tell from looking at the shape of this. We start with, remember we have the male side and we have the female side. We start with, we have no females here. And this is how many females percentage-wise out of the total population we have. So we have infants, okay, and children under four here. Five to nine here all the way up to women that are over 85 in age. So women typically live longer than men in this country, this mock country that we're looking at. And whenever we see a bulge, we know that this group, this demographic group, that something was different here during this time period. It could have been when they were all the way down here when they were born. It could have been things such as um, immigration, a baby boom, so anything that was a sudden growth in a country. Whenever we see a big dip in the country, that's usually related to higher death rates or war, um, disease, or emigration, people leaving a country. So we're going to, we drew a bunch of these in class and we analyzed them in class, but these are the big things that you need to know about this. A broad shape at the top shows that a lot of people are living longer. A narrow base at the bottom shows that we have a low birth rate. Yeah. Okay. So if you can't remember which is which, you should try and guess which one most represents India, the United States, Germany, and China. Which might be represented by any of these? Pause, guess. And here's our answers. So India has this shape, and look at the number. This is in millions now, not percent. You always got to pay attention to your units in your axes. Look how old they're living. And in millions, millions, and millions of babies. In millions for the United States. And notice the shape change here. And notice the shape change here. Okay, so I'm going to finish age structure diagrams because there's a whole lot more to this and demographic transition in a following slideshow. I just wanted to start introducing this so you had a transition from one to the next. This is Mrs. Gabriel signing off. Have a great day.